Hello, everyone, and good morning to all who are tuned in. This is Jeremy Tan from Hong Yong Bank, and I'll be your host for this session. Welcome once again to Hong Yong Bank's fourth sustainability roundtable. The discussion for today's webinar is on the topic of renewable energy, biogas role in supporting Malaysia's energy mix in transitioning towards a low carbon economy. If you have any questions for the panelists, kindly use our dedicated Slido, which you can access by scanning the QR code at the bottom. We are also pleased to be announced as the winner for the National Energy Awards under the Special Awards category for Conventional Sustainable Energy Financing. And we would like to extend our sincere thanks to the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources, as well as Malaysian Green Technology and Climate Change Centre for co-organising the NEA event and for recognising Hong Leong Bank's efforts in driving the sustainability agenda in Malaysia. Now, I would like to introduce our panelists and moderator for today's session. So first off, we have with us today, T.S. Edisham bin Muhammad Sukor, the Director of Market Operations of Sustainable Energy Development Authority, SEDA Malaysia. SEDA Malaysia is a statutory body formed to administer and manage the implementation of the fit-in tariff mechanism, which is mandated under the Renewable Energy Act 2011. T.S. Edisham's responsibility in SEDA involves the management and implementation of all matters relating to the feed-in tariff and net energy metering program. Prior to joining SEDA Malaysia, T.S. Edisham was part of the project team that built the first two megawatt grid connected landfill biogas power plant in Malaysia. And next, we have Dr. Karidin bin Tan Sri Muhammad Hussein, the CEO of Concord Group and Chairman of Asia Pacific Biogas Alliance. The Concord Group is currently one of the main players in the renewable energy sector in Malaysia, as well as in Indonesia, focusing on biogas production for pump oil mill affluent or POME. The group develops biogas plants from POME with renowned partners in the oil palm industry, such as the FGV Group. Datuk Karudin is also the current chairman of the Asia Pacific Biogas Alliance, which has members from organizations across Asia Pacific countries and acts as the regional collective voice to promote sustainable growth and development of the biogas industry. And next, we have I.R. Chan Yan Lun, the Deputy General Manager of Berjaya Energies. I.R. Chan Yan Lun is a practicing civil engineer with over 20 years of engineering and project management expertise in the building construction and environmental engineering industry. Currently, he is leading the esteemed team that oversees the development and operation of renewable energy projects under Berjaya Energies. He played crucial roles from the inception of the landfill gas project in Bukit Tagar Sanitary Landfill, from the first carbon credit flaring project and growing from 1.2 megawatt of installed capacity in 2010 to become the largest landfill gas to energy project in Malaysia with a combined capacity of over 10 megawatt in 2019. And next with us today is Mr. Soon Han Yang, the CEO and founder of Eco Ideal Consulting. During his 21 years of working experience, Mr. Soon has been involved in various biogas and biomass projects throughout Malaysia, including both Sabah and Sarawak. He is instrumental to the development of the largest landfill gas power generation project in Malaysia, as well as the registration of the first biogas carbon credit project in the world, the United Nations. Mr. Soon is also a Certified International Waste Manager by the International Solid Waste Association. And next with us today is Ms. Gladys Mark, the Renewable Energy Specialist of Business and Corporate Banking, Hong Leong Bank. Gladys joined Hong Leong Bank in 2019 and has increased the bank's presence within the renewable energy industry, evidenced by the growth of the renewable energy portfolio over the two years since joining Hong Leong Bank. Prior to joining the bank, she was the Acting Chief Operating Officer and Director of the Fit-in Tariff Division of SEDA Malaysia. Gladys has vast experience in policy implementation relating to the development of renewable energy in the region and was a key member in supporting the development of Malaysia's national renewable energy policy. And finally, we have our moderator for today's panel discussion, Mr. Nick Sharizal Sulaiman, Partner of Risk Assurance Services 
for PwC Malaysia. Nick Sharizal is a partner and the Islamic finance leader of PwC Malaysia and has over 18 years of experience in the assurance and advisory profession. He was trained in the UK as a chartered accountant prior to joining PwC Malaysia in 2007. Nick has been involved in a wide range of work in the industry from strategy, governance, internal audit and risk management. All right, so before we begin with the panel discussion, I would like to welcome Eddie Sham to give a brief presentation on the current status of the biogas industry in Malaysia to set the context for the panel discussion. All right, Eddie Sham, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeremy. Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Edisham, belong to Sedam Malaysia under the Market Operation Division. And as of today, I'm uh, very happy meeting all of you virtually. And uh, a bit uh, of Sedam Malaysia, we are the secretary body of uh, uh, Sedam Malaysia under the Sedam Malaysia Seda uh, Sustainable Energy Development Authority Act uh, 2011 and reported under the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources, uh, KESA. And our key role is to administer and manage the feed-in tariff program, which is mandated under the RE Act 2011. And as you see in the diagram, we have four RE programs in Malaysia, starting from the FIT, LSS, NAM, and CERCO. Out of this, uh, only four, only only one uh, make, um, program, which is FIT. Provide, provides the project for non-solar resources, which is biogas, biomass, and small hydro. We understand that this non-solar project still need assisted uh, by the FIT mechanism, which is uh, provide offer the uh, premium tariff. Uh, technically, we are blessed with 3.6 gigawatt of bioenergy ability in Malaysia, combining of uh, biogas and uh, biomass. Biogas itself is it's about 736 megawatt still huge potential to explore and uh, biogas can be produced by utilizing the anaerobic digester by the energy crop such as sludge uh, municipal solid waste and edible waste from agriculture animal waste waste and uh, uh, landfill during the pro process and a tight in uh, anaerobic digester can transform waste into the uh, methane uh, producing uh, the understanding uh, any 40 tons of the fresh fruit branches uh, can generate about one megawatt while for the municipal three megawatt okay a uh, little bit of the FIT uh, as of now uh, we have approved about 1.3 gigawatt right now and uh, blood in operation is about 656 megawatt and uh, biogas itself is about 150 megawatt and uh, in in the park we have another 687 uh, by, uh, RE plant in the in the in the stream and out of this 101 uh, will coming to the board uh, operate within two or three years uh, okay uh, a bit of RE journey dated back in 2011 the government introduced the RE as a fifth fuel policy and implement the strap project. Yeah, during that time, only 65 megawatt RE plant managed to operate. And uh, in 2010, we can say it's everything start here. Yeah, we have the national RE policy and action plan and wrap up in the house, and we can see the fit in tariff mechanism introduced under the RE Act 2011, and also the birth of Seda Malaysia, which is on 1st September 2011 under the Seda Act. And it's our history start a decade ago, yeah. And uh, five years later, we, we have uh, the government introduced the NAM, Last Case Solar, and Selco. But this program only focused for the solar fuel project. And uh, as of 2020, the RE contributing about 23.5 or 8.5 uh, gigawatt, which is uh, include with the large hydro. And looking forward, the government has set 31% or 12.9 gigawatt capacity, which are from the RE resources uh, by 2025, which is increment about 4.4 gigawatt in, in five years. Uh, and FIT and NSF uh, contribute 37% in the capacity. We are not we are not stopped here since the government has set the target 
or 18 gigawatt uh, by 2035. Lot of a lot of activities has been planned to achieve the 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 target, especially for the bio unit sector, such as uh, exploring the clustering of the mills uh, to combine all the biogas and biomass uh, plant in the one uh, stop center, and conduct ocean for uh, and NEM for the biogas and biogas because so far uh, NEM. Uh, we implement since 2016 only focus for the solar PB. And uh, also the KPKT also provide the tendering of the WTE project uh, for the two sites uh, in the Malacca and Johor. And we can also explore the opportunity based maximizing the bio bioenergy such as a bio CNG and cogeneration. Yeah. And uh, a year back when we mentioned about the anaerobic digester, it always associate with the wastewater treatment plant which place we know well known about the places of the tea and frost smelling. And uh, recently, every year, this plant what, uh, winning, uh, won the National Energy uh, Award, such as 2018 and 2019. Uh, we Most of the biggest plant uh, won the, the award, award. Yeah, This end opener for, and we not uh, be much them. They can surely can beat the solar project, uh, solar PV project, which previously dominating by the this uh, uh, solar PV uh, uh, industry. Yeah, and uh, uh, in year 2000, uh, we of the biogas project uh, not only, uh, won the national award, but both won in the international standard, uh, the Asian Energy Award, and uh, we are not uh, the biogas right now is not the Jago Kampung. They are recognized by the internationally. And uh, this year again, a biogas project won again. And I'm really proud uh, a part of the authority implementing the FIT project in Malaysia. And uh, biogas plant right now is designed another step level uh, compared to the commercial plant biogas when I personally involved uh, somewhere in 2002. Uh, 20 that we only focus how to generate electricity from the biogas, yeah, uh, not to electricity built to the public. And of course, SEDA will engage the feed project owner to share their experience in terms of the socio-economic and uh, job creation during the construction and the operation. Uh, and uh, we can come up with the success story in conjunction with the ten years of SEDA. That's all, Jeremy. Uh, the floor is yours. Over to you. All right. Thank you, Adisham, for your presentation and for your insights to the current policies and overview of the biogas industry in Malaysia. I believe that sets the scene to our topic for today on biogas role in supporting Malaysia's energy mix in transitioning towards a lower carbon economy. So without further ado, I would like to welcome all panelists and moderator for the panel discussion. And I will now pass the time over to Nick to moderate this session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for, for the kind introduction. Uh, so firstly, I'd just like to say uh, greetings and good morning to everyone. Um, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Hong Leong Bank for inviting uh, me to, to moderate the session. Uh, it's definitely a very exciting topic. Uh, so today we have um, you know, five illustrious speakers who will provide their point of view on the topic. But before we get into the discussion, let me just set uh, a bit of context. Um, I think uh, as many people know now, uh, climate change uh, is one of the key topics that's dominating our conversation right now. Uh, if you look at the recent uh, IPCC report, uh, the, the conclusion has been uh, quite uh, very frightening as a matter of fact. Uh, it talked about the risk of uh, irreversible damage to the environment, uh, the fact that we might uh, breach the 1.5 degrees uh, temperature increase globally in the next two decades. Um, and, and following this, you know, the, con the um, uh, conversation about renewable energy has also been taken uh, a lot of focus, um, you know, within the, the industry. So, so I suppose, um, you know, uh, Edisham gave a very good context just now in terms of, you know, the policy developments uh, in Malaysia and also the potential. Um, I'd just like to, to jump into the discussion by posing my first question to Datuk Khairuddin. So Datuk, let's just take this, you know, very, very simple and high level for, you know, for, for, for a start. How big do you think is the potential of the biogas industry in Malaysia and um, and why? Yeah, uh, Assalamualaikum, uh, uh, Saudara Nick, and also the panelists and the audience. 
uh, first of all, answering the question, um, I must say that the biogas potential in Malaysia is still very big. The upside is still very big because one thing about Malaysia, we are very blessed uh, whereby we have ample and more than sufficient feedstocks to do biogas. For example, in Malaysia, uh, almost all the biogas plant in Malaysia, the feedstock, we use it from Pome. And Pome, you get it from the palm oil mill effluent from the palm oil mills. And being blessed, uh, the country is blessed with over 450 mills throughout the country. So um, this one is a ready feedstock for us to utilize to do biogas. And it's not something that you have to create new. Is something that is already there, and currently, um, uh, maybe maybe Mr. Disham can can correct me if I'm wrong. But my understanding is um, only about 20 to 30 percent of the palm oil mills in Malaysia have biogas. And the government moving forward, the government is giving a directive that from now on to move forward, all palm oil mills in Malaysia have to give have to have a biogas plant. And for a biogas plant, um, I mean for a mill owner to have a biogas plant, you can do it for compliance. But when you do it for compliance purpose, in order to, to comply with the government directive, or even for you to satisfy some maybe RSPO certification or the global body certification, and for you to just for the compliance sake, you, you'll be investing in something that you don't get any return. But what Seda Malaysia has done, Seda Malaysia has introduced this FIT uh, mechanism whereby when you build a biogas plant at palm oil mills in Malaysia, you can also generate income for you to get returns. And the income and returns from the Seda FIT system is very attractive. And one more thing is very certain because you have to sign uh, with Seda Malaysia giving you the quota, then you have to sign a power purchase agreement with the NB over a period of 21 years. So even when uh, you do the project, you have the comfort and your stakeholders have the comfort that your income is certain, your off-taker is certain to move forward. So the potential in Malaysia is still very large for biogas. That one we are just talking in terms of FIT. You also have uh, alternative uses for biogas. For example, maybe in uh, Sabah and Sarawak, uh, places whereby it's far, maybe infrastructure also is far, the substation is far. Then you have the options of doing biogas to convert uh, to bio CNG, or you can do biogas as excess power for internal plant operation or your plantation operation. So those are the users uh, need uh, moving forward for biogas. The future is bright for the industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Datuk Khairuddin. I think that sets a very good context into this uh, conversation. I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, the ecosystem is there, uh, the, the, the economic rationale is there, and, uh, you know, it would incentivize many players to to get into this this industry. Uh, Gladys, my, my next question goes to you. I mean, as, as we all know, um, you know, the banking industry plays a big role in terms of growth of this industry or any industry for for that matter. So so I'm quite curious to, to hear your, your point of view from the perspective Perspective of the banking industry is this an area which the banking industry generally uh, are going to support support more uh, because of you know the renewable factor? What's your view? Thanks, uh, Nick, and um, good morning, everyone. Well, yes, um, obviously from the bank's, bank's perspective, the opportunities are vast for biogas, and as Dr. Kairudin mentioned, with a very conducive sort of policy where government has put in initiative. So um, it makes sense, as, especially as, as we all know, right, moving forward, um, issues of, um, you know, climate change and the government putting in effort to actually have targets to reduce so GHG emissions. So it's something that as a bank, um, especially at Hong Leong Bank, we've been supporting a lot of uh, renewables as, and uh, not just solar, like uh, we've also supported a lot of biogas. There's also, um, you know, not only biogas from palm oil mill effluents, but we're also looking at different sorts of waste resources. And it's just because um, at the end of the day, all of this, it's just waste that 
can actually be turned to commodity. And as Dr. Karidin has uh, easily explained it, it's not really rocket science. It's just, you know, capturing um, biogas that's actually a product of degradation of organic material. And it's coming up from, you know, a mill discharges about 0.7 to 1 meter cube of POMI for every ton of FFB produce uh, process. So with capturing of that gas to produce electricity or it, that electricity can either be you know pumped to the grid and it's sold under PPA um, or even used internally so these are the, the sort of um, economic additional economic um, sectors that definitely as a bank we would like to support um, also as I mentioned with reduction of GHG um, we also can then address issues related to you know climate change and how it actually will impact economy so um, biogas is definitely one of those sectors yes thank you very much Gladys um, so it sounds like um, you know there is a big support from the banking sector as well which is very encouraging uh, my next question goes to you soon. I mean, uh, you know, you've been in the industry for, for a long time. You've been involved in many of these projects. I mean, we've heard uh, the perspective of uh, Edisha Malia from the perspective of agency. We've heard the context of the market growth and we've heard the banking sector. So my question to you is from, from your perspective, you know, um, is this, you know, as, as straightforward as it is? Are there any any key challenges that, that that you observe in the industry based on your experience so far? Yeah, thanks, Dink. Yeah, so um, just to introduce myself a little bit, uh, I'm a environmental engineer by training, and I've been working with biogas projects since uh, 2003. And so uh, over the years, I've been working with government as well as private sectors to develop biogas projects. And I do see um, a lot of uh, opportunities, but also a lot of challenges in uh, developing these projects. Um, for example, in Sabah, Sarawak, um, it's a total different landscape compared to Peninsula. You know, we have a different uh, electricity grid system in Sabah, Sarawak. It's run by the Sarawak Energy and in Sabah by SESB. And infrastructure wise, because of the vast land and uh, relatively low population density, the infrastructure for electricity is not there. Yeah, so many of the sources of this biogas, for example, power mills are off grid, yeah, as, as uh, mentioned by Dazo Karadin already. So I think this naturally gives, gives us a challenge on um, how do you generate a revenue from your biogas, right? Um, so, so I think what the country needs to do moving forward to explore the remaining of the biogas potential is to come up with new economic instruments. Yeah, for example, maybe a government should look at how to incentivize upgrading of biogas into bio CNG as one option, or maybe giving uh, other options to the, bio, uh, the, the sources of the biogas plants. So I think that's that's one of the key challenges. Infrastructure connection is one, and uh, also for for your information, in Sabah Sarawak there are no uh, fit-in tariff offers, unfortunately. Yeah, so the offers by Sarawak Energy, for example, is as low as 21 cent, which is the uh, shrap time uh, which Eddie mentioned earlier uh, during the small renewable energy program. I was working then already actually. So so I think those are some of the reasons uh, why. A lot of our biogas plants in Sarawak, for example, are just flaring the gas off, which is to me a, a waste of resources. Uh, so I, I think there's still a lot to do to be done. And uh, uh, industry expert like Concord Energy, um, banks like Hong Leong will all play a role. And perhaps even myself as a consultant in, in technical sense, helping them to, to conceptualize this uh, type of projects will be important. Thank you very much. Sue. Um, I, I thought that's a very interesting statement. You, I mean, I'm not an engineer by training, but um, I hear you mentioned that currently because of lack of infrastructure, some of the gas, are, you know, they're flat, they're, they're wasted. I mean, how, how, how big of a waste is this? Are we, are we missing on a big potential here? Yeah, I think um, I, I just look at the statistics this morning um, in terms of let's say palm oil mills, one of the main sources today in Malaysia, only 30% of it has biogas plants. And I think only, I don't have the numbers for that, but 
probably less than half of it are using the energy for something. So, so I think that there's a there's a huge potential to make use of the energy rather than just burning it off. Yeah, because flaring basically means you burn it off uh, to to destroy the methane, but you still produce CO2. Yeah, so I think those those are the the ones we should be looking into on how to value add to those biogas. Definitely, definitely. Um, Chen, my next question Hi. goes to you. Uh, you you also an engineer by, by training. Can you shed some lights in terms of what are the industry or practical challenges that, that you see uh, based on your observation? Yeah, I mean, uh, back when that's just uh, our company experience. We kick off our landfill, first landfill biogas project under the CDM project, uh, under the Kyoto Protocol. But we started as a gas flaring, not the uh, gas power generation. <clears throat> Only in 2011, we have our first 1.2 megawatt gas engine under the SRAP program. Uh, within eight years until 2019, we gradually increased our gas engine capacity to 10.4 megawatt with six units of uh, gas engine. That's roughly two to three years we added a new engine. So over the years, I mean, for the past 10 years, we have all the challenges because at first this is very challenging because of the uh, not only for us and also for the other stakeholders but this thing are uh, very new to our uh, to us and to the other stakeholders we encounter the design error interconnection issues load issues i mean there's electricity load issues and the unstable gas extraction and the gas delivery even pass availability for the uh, our system is also an issue to us uh, because all those uh, the system we are we buy it from overseas so the availability for those we uh, pass we need to wait for a few months that it will be keep our how to say our uptime our efficiency to power generation is uh, is a challenge. Plus, Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, go on, John. Please continue. Yeah. yeah. But we learned that over the years, in order to run a, the major factor to run a successful landfill biogas would be the whatever resources given to us, especially the human resource. We would need to secure a good workers. So that's why we have our men to check our daily system, train and check our daily system. And their respond to any faulty is very crucial as every minute that we lose is uh, every minute down is the every every minute we lose. That's why, in my opinion, human resource is a determining factor for maintaining the efficiency of any of the power generation system. Absolutely. Th yeah. Thank you very much, and for, for for your point of view. Um, so 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 that actually puts um, a, a very interesting perspective on this whole conversation. Because on one hand, we see there is a huge opportunity there. The world is moving towards renewable energy, um, you know. But at the same time, there are also some practical challenges in terms of infrastructure, you know, human resource, and the rest of it. So so Adisham, I, I suppose uh, you know my next uh, question would naturally go to you, you know, because of your role in you know uh, pushing and. Supporting Supporting the industry, uh, you've heard the the, the the issues and challenges that Soon and Chan uh, mentioned um, earlier. What what is your point of view with, with regards to to these issues? What what can be done further? Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, as a great regulator and a government implementing the renewable energy, uh, renewable energy in Malaysia, and uh, we need we know all the challenges and we 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 plan how to mit mitigate the challenges. Yeah, and. Uh, I just would uh, bring way back to during straight project. Yeah, during straight project, we only can sell the electricity generated from the biogas at uh, 21 cents. Yeah, 21 cents. Just imagine, uh, I putting two Ferrari uh, in our side, uh, generating, uh, maintain and ramp it uh, every day to make a uh, optimized generating of the electricity, and we just get 21 cents. When we come back to 2011, when FIT mechanism, yeah, when FIT mechanism come to the board, we can get 42 cents. This double, yeah, and your ROI can get earlier. Uh, can can pay back to the banks. 
as earlier compared to the set project. Then we start gradually uh, hear from the industry how to increase the, the, the tariff. Firstly, we did you, uh, we uh, remove all the degress rate. Yeah? Before this, all the rates under FIT is degress at 0.5% uh, for, for biogas. We make it zero rise. Second thing, we recognize all the local assembled biogas engine. We did add up from two cent to the five cent, and uh, we make it all the all the resources from uh, by agriculture, animal waste, uh, sewage, and uh, electric gas flat at uh, eight cent. That's total increase from forty two cent to forty six point seven cent per kilowatt hour. That's double. And uh, starting two thousand eleven, uh, two thousand eighteen. We change the repair renewal from 16 years to 21 years. That's another way, another another mitigation that we tackle all the uh, 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 input from the industry. And uh, we understand that MPOB also uh, mandated all the millers to to have the biogas capturing system starting 2014. Then this uh, re regulation made a big impact in terms of the grapping quota, FIT quota, starting 2014, uh, including with our increase the FIT rate and this uh, regulation from uh, mandated by the MPOB. And uh, uh, starting 2011, we see there's a potential, huge potential from the biogas industry, and we start giving the competitive bidding because the FIT is dependent, dependable of the RE fund. We can give the FIT rate at higher, but at certain numbers of the biogas bio player can, can participate because it's related quota and the RE fund. That's why we introduced the e bidding system starting 2018. And uh, based on the record, uh, starting 2018, uh, we have 45 megawatt applied under the e bidding system. Uh, compare with this, uh, we allocate quota 30 megawatt, similar to in 2019, 47 megawatt uh, bits and from the quota given 30 megawatt. And uh, 2021, during MCO, because we do all the online application, we still receive over subscribe. Uh, we uh, give 31.805 megawatt uh, and we receive 36 megawatt. That's we know the huge potential uh, biogas industry and we need to uh, make uh, give uh, how to mitigate the, the all the challenges yeah, in terms of the and, and the uh, the feed rate. Thank okay, you. second thing we understand that the uh, uh, now uh, we have uh, as our MPB record we have 450 uh, mills uh, at Peninsula Sabah and Sarawak, eh? and uh, uh, personally uh, at Sabah and Sabah and Peninsula we have uh, uh, FIT mechanism yeah. Uh, from there, we have 200 megawatt already approved under FIT. That's half of the millers. If we, if we make it uh, average uh, one megawatt per mills, yeah, we can provide already provide 50% of the millers to connect a uh, biogas plant from the uh, from this selling the electricity. Uh, that's all needs. Thank you very much, Adi. Uh, Gladys, uh, you would like to to add a few points to that? Yes, Nick. Um, felt a little bit excited and nostalgic talking about this topic. So I actually wanted to put some perspective because um, so prior to joining the bank, you know, when I was in said um, actually in Eddie's shoes or even before that, when we were drafting, I was wearing a different cap drafting the national renewable energy policy at that point of time. So biogas started off, you know, obviously there was the small renewable energy um, program, which offered initially 17 cents and then went up to 21 cents. And then there was a United Nations program together with the government to start what we call a biogen um, pilot scale biogas plan. It was with Felda. And again, um, it was a five year program just to get a very small biogas plant up and running. It, it was kind of like to show and to um, to advertise to the, the corporate world that yeah, biogas plant can work, but it took that long. But, um, and then just before we started the work on the National Renewable Policy, obviously we had to look at what, what went wrong, you know, why is it that we had 10 years and only 65 megawatts of total renewable that, that came on board into the country. So one was the, the biggest issue was because of the rates. Obviously, you know, um, bankability, zero. You now, if you do the IRR calculations, you're not going to get a bank 
to actually support that sort of um, rates for the investment. Like Eddie said, two Ferraris and you're getting 17 cents later on 19 cents. So when my team and I, when we were drafting the fit in tariff at that point of time, we had to actually put a basis of, you know, yeah, we obviously it's to actually help with renewables, green the earth, uh, reduce emissions. But, you know, at the end of the day, it has to have an ROI or an IRR or else it's never going to take off. So that's why the fit rates would actually, you know, they were drafted and they were actually calculated or, you know, we, we kind of came up with the rates to make sure that, you know, when you go to the bank, you show these rates, you show a PPA and the PPA has to be bankable, it will take off. So then 2011 came, so I, that's why you see like, I think Burjaya also converted from a strap to, you know, yeah. to a fit in tariff. And then uh, Datuk Khairuddin um, Concord, actually, it's a product of a fit in tariff, I think. The, the interest started when the rates actually make sense. And so I think that's what I think the message should be that um, let's just not talk about green just because it's nice and all that, but it has to be, you know, I remember telling, um, you know, the government at that point of time that we have to make it profitable as well. And then businesses will come in naturally. And the incentives does not have to be so much, but just enough to catalyze. And then we'll go into a market sort of uh, arrangement. So I think that's what ha ha that has happened in Peninsula. And I think it's time to maybe look and see how, you know, Sabah and Sarawak can actually then come towards that as well. You know, um, maybe not via incentive of a fit and tariff, but, you know, other sort of mechanisms that will then bring the IRR to an acceptable rate for the banks. That's thanks. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Gladys. So, so it's not just um, a question of, you know, uh, environment and sustainability, but economics as well, um, which, you know, brings me to the next question to uh, Dato Khairuddin. So I think as what we've heard in our, you know, in the, in the, in the last 20 minutes, there, there are lots of, you know, dynamics here. You know, we are talking about uh, tariff rates. We are talking about, um, you know, the supply and demand. So, so from your perspective as an industry player, what are the, the key key industry risks that, that you see and, and how can these be, be addressed? So, uh, yeah, Nick, maybe, maybe before I answer your specific questions, maybe I just wish to add a bit more on what uh, Chair Edishan and Ms. Gladys mentioned just now. Actually, being the chairman of the Asia Pacific Biogas Alliance, I get the opportunity to compare the framework and the incentives given by the government uh, in the region. And I must say that when I compare with all countries in the region, especially when you say about South Asia, actually Malaysia, we have the best framework. We have the best incentives in the country. I mean, if, I mean, we went through from, from scratch, being being a zero biogas player in 2014. Then we learned through the hard way, like what Ms. Lady said, that we, we took one step at a time. But the government has been very supportive of us. I think in terms of incentives, because Concord Group, we also do biogas projects in Indonesia. We do biogas plan, we do bio CNG plan in Indonesia. We also look into Thailand so we can compare. And being in the APBA, I could compare the framework between the countries in the region. Nothing can compare with what the government in Malaysia is offering. For example, like ourselves, I mean, we are we are the recipient, for example, from MIDA. MIDA has the pioneer status, have the ITA, have the ITE, the income tax exemptions. We have SEDA giving the quota FIT. Then we have MGTC helping with the players to get loans to give interest rebate. We have the CGC, we have the Danajamin to give the corporate, I mean the government guarantee to help us to get loans. Then you have the, for example, like the East Coast Economic Corridor. We have the bioeconomy, the soft loans given. We have the Traju grant given 15%. Uh, so whatever that we invest, Traju gives us back 15% after you complete the projects. So in other countries, actually, there's no helping hand, something of, of that sort. So we have to be very proud and we are, we are very fortunate. We are giving all these chances in this country to perform. But the problem, what I can see is that, like, for example, for a new, new player, when they come in, they do not know where to go. And this is where, I mean, the industry, I mean, for example, like industry players like myself, even like ladies being in Hong Leong, Chek Edisham, this is where we have to help out the new players to come in, to guide them 
on where to go. That is very important. So in terms of uh, moving forward, for example, the FIT scheme is a very good scheme given by the government. It helps the biogas developers because it's still a, a government driven initiative, RE in Malaysia. But uh, talking about Sabah and Sarawak just now, I, I hear you asking, asking uh, Mr. Eddie about how to improve on this biogas connectivity. At the end of the day, it also depends on the state government policy moving forward, whether they, they are into FIT scheme or they have other plans for the, for the states. So I think uh, that answers, uh, and I, I've given my point on the question you raised before, Nick. And secondly, sorry, Nick, maybe you can repeat the question again on the risks, is it? Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. You know, what, what are the industry risks that, that, that you see and how, how can this be addressed? Okay, um, first of all, uh, before you start, for example, a biogas project. Biogas project, one, for example, two megawatt plant can cost you anywhere between maybe 15 to 20 million. So if you are a mill owner um, going forward, because all mills in Malaysia have to get, have to have a biogas plant. That, that is the directive moving forward from the government. If not now, it will be in the near future. So um, the mill owner have to decide, do they want to invest in this? Or they might invite people like developers like us, Concord Group to come in to do biogas for them. So for example, uh, the way we do is that we come in, we come in, we invest, but before you invest in the biogas plant, there are certain risks that you need to look into because we will be spending, we'll be investing about 20 million for a two megawatt. You cannot make mistake. You have to take into account all these risks upfront. So for example, first of all, you have to perform feasibility, viability studies. Then secondly, for example, like, like us, we need to know who will be your mill owner partners, who will be that have synergy with you. For example, like in our case, we uh, we have signed contract with Felda, FGV, and we find them to be one of the best partners around. And they are very supportive of us. Um, and Alhamdulillah, we managed to commission four plants and now operating their plants for the last three, four years. So you need to have very good partners also. Thirdly, uh, before you apply for any FIT or biogas project, even you, before you start off, do a proper cash flow because uh, you need to take into account. For example, if you do biogas under FIT, your income that you get is constant. I mean, you the, the income that you get, the rate that you get over the 21 years is the same. But your expenses, the inflation goes up. So you need to do a very detailed cash flow so that you know at the end of the day, the payback period uh, will be not, not so long for you. And worst case, you wish to avoid whereby uh, in the last maybe 10 years, in the early stage of uh, biogas, there were quite a number of meals uh, which have biogas plants but couldn't perform. So this thing, let's say if you have proper planning, hopefully you can avoid this, these mistakes, I would say. Then, uh, more importantly also, before you start a biogas project, you need to have a very strong banker. You need to have a very strong financier to support you. Like, like us, uh, we were fortunate, we are very glad that Hong Leong came uh, to finance us in our first project up to 90%. Uh, at the time whereby uh, many people didn't believe much in biogas project, didn't have confidence in FIT project, Hong Leong was there to support us. Hong Leong was there to guide us. And now you see, uh, I must say that Hong Leong, when we started three, four years ago, they were also very new in biogas. But now I must say Hong Leong, they are, they are the best for, for biogas, for RE in Malaysia, they are the best. And they have the best people, the most competent people around. And I'm not surprised to see them winning the, the best bank in, uh, in the NEA last year. So with all this, with the government incentives given by the various agencies I mentioned before, then only when you have all this under under your belt, you are confident of doing it, then only you go and do your SEDA application to go for the tender. Because you know when you go under tender, it's also mainly based on the pricing. So your pricing has to stay and whatever margin has to be there over that 21 years. So that, that would be the steps that I would look into, uh, Nick, before I invest or I proceed with a biogas plan. Those are the risks involved. 
Thank you very much, Dato. And, and also well done, Gladys and Hong Dong. I think that is a very <laughs> clear you. vote of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Dato. Thank you, Nick. Uh, okay, so next question to to you soon. Um, you know, can can you also provide your insights? Uh, you know, in terms of the, the industry risks. You know, following what uh, Dato Hyridin mentioned earlier. Uh, sure, <clears throat> sure. <clears throat> in fact, I just uh, spoke to one of the biogas operator a few days back, and they are trying now to justify why they are not uh, performing as as per requirement. And uh, the reasons I've been told is uh, MCO, the COVID totally uh, not um, accounted in the cash flow uh, estimation earlier because the mill, uh, this is a Palmer mill biogas for, for information. So the mill has to be closed down because of the AEMCO, MCO. And then on top of that, there's also this climate related impact like El Nino that has affected the uh, fresh fruit branch production. Uh, so the palm oil estates were not able to produce sufficient uh, fruits for the meal, and that resulted in operational uh, uh, inefficiency. So, so these are some of the, the things that when you are planning ahead, as Dato said, uh, I've done a lot of feasibility studies and cash flow uh, IR calculations. Uh, sometimes you, you, you don't account for this, right? So, so your, your financial model would, would basically run away uh, from your expectations. So I think these are things that you have to immediately do something about it, uh, reach out to experts if you need to, because there are some biogas plants that doesn't perform, uh, simple, be simply because the processes are not uh, working, there are inhibitors in your, in your, in your, um, in your digesters. You know, there are so many technical um, issues related to the biogas process. It's, it's a biological process. It's not a physical or chemical process. It's a biological process, so you must make sure the, the bacteria, the methanogens are happy, you know. So so you need you do need experts. And uh, I have to say that over the last almost 20 years, the biogas technologies and experience have uh, matured in Malaysia. I have, I have to say that over the years. Right. Yeah, so, so uh, I think I I have a follow up question soon. I mean, you mentioned about the import, uh, you know, experts, you know, which is, of course, you know, very important to have the right talent pool in the country to to, to drive this, um, you know, this industry. Uh, what, what is your point of view about the talent pool in this country with regards to this particular industry? Should more be done within our academic institutions to to basically, you know, uh, push this industry further to, to create more technical uh, engineers that specialize in this issue? What's your view? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, I think the the academic uh, sector has to play a bigger role in terms of research. Earlier on, we talked about new opportunities of biogas, right? I mean, in terms of new research, how to convert the uh, biogas into a, a high methane content uh, bio CNG. How do you make use of the uh, digested, which is the leftover of the process? And this is typically a problem. Uh, you can't just discharge direct to the uh, river, um, whereas there are nutrients inside still. There are a lot of things that can be retrieved. So I think a lot of research, a lot of technical expertise shall be continued uh, to be de developed in Malaysia. And my wish is, of course, to see the talent pool to be more organized as well uh, in, in Malaysia so that we can build uh, knowledge upon each other. I think today's event is a very good one uh, where experts can sit down and talk to each other um, and, and I think that that would be a way forward also to qualify the experts as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Harudin, would you like to add a few points? Yeah, um, uh, following up on what Sun has mentioned, actually, um, for example, um, part, part of the our CSR initiative, uh, as uh, we, are, we are guided by SEDA in this, we, we are looking into uh, localizing a lot of biogas technology. For example, like for example, let's say you say 10, 15 years ago, uh, uh, in terms of the design, the engineering of biogas plant, usually we have to call the experts from overseas. But what what I can say now, most of the biogas uh, main biogas developers in Malaysia, we do our own design, we do our own engineering, and we train our staff. I mean, they come out from the university, we train them, and they become engineers. And uh, with that, our the 
the investment in staff, uh, foreign staff, foreign technology will be very, very minimal, I would say. Nick. And also, for example, like uh, what we are doing currently in Hong Kong, we are also training uh, quite a number of uh, university students as trainees uh, in our plans, which is in operation. And also, for example, I give you one example. We are also doing for a university in Trengganu, whereby we do module for their biogas uh, uh, diploma and degree program. So we have, uh, for example, we have just signed a five year uh, collaboration with them, whereby we provide the module for them, for the university, and then they will use the module and they will invite us to become like a lecturer or speaker uh, moving forward. So these are part of the initiatives that we are looking into. Besides that, we are also doing with University Petronas, University Nottingham, uh, UPM, UNP in Pahang. So we are looking into all that. We are, we are trying to get the community to be part of uh, this biogas development in Malaysia. So these are some of the initiatives that uh, we are looking into with the support of the government agencies like SEDA. Nick. Excellent, uh, Dato. I mean, it sounds like, you know, you're creating, um, you know, helping to create a new layer of experts, you know, to support the industry. Uh, well done on that initiative. Um, Edisham, you, you, uh, you know, would like to add a few points, please? Yeah, thank you, Nick. Okay, operating the biogas plant uh, actually is a, is a, uh, another state of the competency level that the, we need to uh, uh, to to implement to have all the personnel in 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 in, uh, in the biogas side, uh. and uh, actually when we run the biogas plant, uh, we normally be focus the engine need to generate uh, properly can produce electricity, but actually it's not. The recipe is all the way how you operate the anaerobic digester tanks to itself, how you blend, how you make sure all the BOD and how to. From there, they can produce the good quality and quantity of the biogas. Yeah, that's why from there, on part of the SEDA, we focus on the operating and maintenance of the biogas plant. We have the modules. We not focus on the design because all the design, we know uh, the professional, professional engineer or consultant in Malaysia is, is, uh, is good enough to design the biogas plant. And uh, for the gas engine part, we have all the uh, local assemble of the gas engine in Malaysia, yeah, and but we still lack on the operating, yeah. That's why we focus based on the uh, on the standard we have uh, from the TVET, uh, TVET, uh, from uh, we develop the biogas and, and uh, biogas operated operation operation and maintenance uh, for the biogas plant, especially for the non technical, for the spoiler and technical, yeah. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much, Adisham. Uh, Chan, my, my next question goes to you. We, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, talent. We talk a lot about regulations and so on. Uh, by my next topic, I'd just like to, to get a bit more insights about what are the emerging trends that you observe in the industry? I mean, not just in Malaysia, but basically in other regions as well. Can, can you share with us uh, your, your insights on this? Uh, I see the trend is, in, I mean, in Malaysia first, uh, is a... Uh, is moving upwards, especially for the landfill gas. Uh, on the landfill gas, uh, we can see more and more regional landfill has been constructed. So with this more re more regional landfill, we can have more uh, the landfill gas that can be harvested uh, as the the size of the landfill is uh, bigger and more volume for the gas to be harvested. Uh, this would easier to achieve for our, I mean, the, our target that uh, just now, uh, until Elisha had mentioned, uh, the potential of the biogas, uh, solid waste to the biogas uh, renewable energy is around 500 ton, 500 ton for three megawatts. So in Malaysia, we have uh, 33,000 ton per day. So we have another, we would have the availability of the gas of uh, 200 megawatts. So definitely we can see from the landfill gas perspective, we will have uh, the room to, to go around it. So uh, over the years, uh, the trend, I can see that uh, we have more technology that can support us in operating our systems. So one thing that we are looking at is, which we have also have installed, 
as uh, we have a 19 km cable connecting to the interconnection point. So we call it this uh, early fault detection. So this system uh, is installed along the cable and it will give us a 24 hours uh, monitoring of the condition of the cables. Uh, meaning that we can see that the, the status of the cable, if anything that it detected to be uh, deteriorating or start to getting malfunction, we will get the signal first and we can plan for the uh, for the repair works so that we can reduce the unplanned outages. As other than I can see that uh, maybe the gas compression that just, just now Tato has mentioned, the gas compression that uh, that can be go for away, for the, if possible, can go for the FIT as well, it would be good. I think Seda is looking into it already. So definitely it's good to us because our interconnection point is definitely is an issue to us. So another way to uh, export out our landfill gas would be the best. Right, right. Excellent. Um, Soon, would you like to add a few points of view on top of that? Yeah, I just want to come back to the capacity issue that we mentioned, the human capacity. Uh, I thought about one point because when I was uh, discussing with the Palmer uh, Mills with regards to ut utilizing the biogas uh, electricity, then I get to know actually most of the Palmer Mills are not designed to take in the biogas electricity because they typically they have more than enough uh, resources from the biomass to generate power. So uh, what I'm trying to get to is perhaps the engagement uh, has to also involve the designer of the palm oil mills to already, especially for the new mills, to already in, integrate this design into the palm oil mill design so that perhaps more biogas can be released from the supply chain. Because biomass is also a resource which we, we not the focus of this discussion, but uh, mesocarp fiber, palm kernel shells, they are very much sought after now. Uh, not only in Malaysia, in overseas as well for low carbon uh, objectives. So I think if the mills can be designed to already take in this biogas power, then we have no issue. Because I have a lot of cases where they said, I don't need this power. You know, I have more than enough uh, uh, power sources. What, what do I have to invest another 10 million for my uh, biogas plant engine and all, all that? So, so I think that's one of the things I, I, I want to um, propose to the government, maybe to also engage the designer of the mills, not only the mills, but also other other uh, uh, industries like livestock. Livestock is another source of biogas, which not fully explored yet. Um, industries, food and beverage industries, huge potential there for biogas, also not been uh, fully explored. So I think that's one of the points I want to make. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Gladys, would you like to add one of your Yes, thanks, Nick. Um, I, um, I think there was an echo. Um, actually, I wanted to touch a little bit, uh, go back to the part where we talk about risk. So it's just something that I've observed because um, having, you know, see, seeing and observing the biogas cases that come in, there's one, one part which I like to highlight to, you know, the audiences out there who are listening or trying to actually learn and get gain more insights um, to start a conversation with regards to effect of climate change on a power plant that you're actually designing or developing. Um, we already know a Ministry of um, the Environment and also Water, they've said that you know it's already a known fact. Scientists have shown that even in Malaysia, our temperatures have increased. Rainfall has also increased. You know, you see floods, all floods happening, uh, Gunung Jerai and things like that. So in designing a, a biogas plant, the location and the effects of flood, you might not see it today, but it's important to actually ensure that you've also done at least some analysis to see that over the, you know, it's now, as Eddie mentioned, the PPA is from 16 to 21 years. So it's going to be over two decades. And IPCC already has said that over two decades, you know, if our temperature goes up 1.5%, 1.5 degrees, it's kind of like um, bye bye to many areas. So this is a conversation that they need to have internally, you know, check on 
the effects of temperature, the effects of uh, rainfall towards their development. So those are the risks that they should actually you know, talk about. Can, can I just make a quick comment to that? Sure. It's, it's yes. just struck my, my mind that uh, I have seen, I think you know, Chan can confirm that another natural disaster for biogas project is the lightning. It, it, it will just, I think biogas also get a lot of that, you know, because it's an open area. So once the lightning comes, it will strike you. Um, uh, Chan, correct? That's all um, the system down, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's really? something wow. that has to be designed carefully. Yeah. yeah. Wow, I had no idea. Yes, can can you can you guys expand a bit more on that? Uh, you know that sounds so no, interesting and because, scary uh, as well. <laughs> because of the landfill, actually, it's not the direct hit from the the lightning. Actually, at the landfill, it's it's an open area, so it's prone for the lightning to strike or uh, nearby on the ground. Even they strike nearby on the ground, they will they will give a surge to our electricity uh, surrounding surround, uh, environment, electricity environment. And those uh, those uh, computer SCADA, those uh, sensors are, are very, those, especially those uh, extra low voltage uh, equipment will easily fry up because of all this uh, sudden surge. So definitely uh, in our current design, we have added some of those uh, such uh, protectors, such suppressions uh, to avoid all these things. But it's, uh, it still can come, it only can reduce the risk, but we don't know when it comes back. <laughs> True, but wow. I think that's why the key thing is like any for any power plant out there, uh, it's very important that all of this is covered and you, you get the experts involved in providing the design. Lightning true, protection true. is always one thing that you know you should also never stinge or never not look into. Um, and again, I think this is where it, there's a difference between experience and newcomers. So if you're a newcomer, get experienced people to actually help you design. Uh, don't think that you want to actually reduce your capex just by trying to, you know, <laughs> leapfrog. And yeah, and for the experience, they know what to look at. And I think that's where they can actually do a lot of our improvements and efficiencies can increase. So that is something that, you know, that's a difference between experienced players and newcomers, which also as from a bank's perspective, we take into consideration. Um, for newcomers, yeah, you you definitely have to show that you're actually engaging the right people with experience, and you're not, you know, just going with uh, whatever device or equipment that is available from the market without any proven track record. That's that's yeah. not going to be easy. Yeah. Wow. So so it's uh, you know it's amazing that the more that you you, you dive deeper into the issues, there are actually a lot of risks. The uh, you know um, a lot of issues. I mean, not just um, you know the demand, but engineering and even lightning. And and actually you know based on what I've been reading, I mean, this risks of lightning. You know um, you know extreme weather events. There have been a lot of scientific reports which suggest that you know the world is going to see more and more of that. So perhaps you know something which is you know people will think unlikely may not be that unlikely after all. Um, okay, so so let's get to, to the next uh, theme of question. So let's discuss about what is the, the, the way forward for the industry and perhaps for this, uh, Dr. Hairudin, maybe you can share your point of view. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, I think the way forward for the industry uh, in order to, to expand the industry and to make Malaysia becoming more competitive in this industry uh, in the region, First of all, a lot of the technology design has to be localized because we have capable people now being trained in Malaysia. We have uh, capable employees or engineers that we can train. Uh, and secondly, in terms of the equipments, there are a lot of R&D being done, uh, not only by the biggest players uh, in specific, but also in the industry. For example, like uh, take example for for example like ourselves. Um, previously, I mean, besides the gas engine, because gas, gas engine is considered the, the single biggest uh, expenditure in a biogas plant, whereby if you have two gas engine, it will cost anywhere between five to seven million ringgit. But other than that, whatever equipment that we can do, whatever that we can fabricate, we are trying to do our own R&D and install at our site. Uh, one example is uh, with the help of SEDA and various government agencies, we are also doing R&D um, for, for example, for our bio scrubber. For example, before this bio scrubber, we always have to source from Europe, either mainly from Italy or from France. 
But this is where something that through R&D, we can localize the technology. And for example, based on our R&D, we have um, created our own bio scrubber, which we will put in use in the next one or two months in our project in Terengganu. So this, this is, uh, I think, the main, the way forward for the country, meaning a lot of things uh, we have to do our own R&D and we have to try to localize to make sure that the industry grows and the people and the community grows. And secondly, um, talking about, I, I, I was quite um, um, interested in the discussion just now about the risk involved in managing a biogas plant. Yes, it's true. For example, like ourselves, uh, all our plants are in the East Coast. So during monsoon period, during um, during bad weather, heavy wind, I mean, we have suffered, we have suffered. Uh, certain places have to be shut down, uh, certain uh, landslide uh, near our side, uh, and also when the plantation uh, gets filled with water, the, the palm oil mill plantation uh, during the monsoon, we also suffered in terms of the FFB that can be processed by the mills which equates to the pomme being flowed into our system. But what is more important is how do you prepare for that? So, for example, when you know, for example, next month or uh, in the next two months, the monsoon is coming in the East Coast. So how do you do? So strategy is very important and this goes with experience. So like now, for example, like what we are doing, we are getting our chief of plan to discuss with the mill owner, to discuss with the surrounding mills, on how to buy some more fruits, how to prioritize to give it to us because we are a power plant. So that is important, meaning having problem is one thing, but how do you solve and managing that problem is, I think, the way forward we have to see from here. So um, I hope I answered your question, Nick, uh, on that. On the way thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. And then uh, one more, just, just to add some more. Uh, just now we we spoke about um, alternative besides FIT. So the alternative besides FIT, because for example, like in Indonesia, which I think in Sabah and Sarawak also, the condition is uh, similar or likewise. Uh, if FIT is not available, then you have to look into other ways. For example, you capture uh, biogas to do bio CNG, and then you do as a diesel replacement for your for your mills for your plantation. For your for your vehicles, those are the things that we have done in Indonesia, whereby we can do in Malaysia, for example. Or secondly, maybe uh, uh, if let's say now we are in the discussion with Seda Malaysia and Che Adisham's team, whereby we are we are proposing why don't we do FIT for bio CNG rather than only for electricity. Uh, so these are the next step moving forward, and the government is looking into it. Uh, I can say, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hyverdin. Okay, so uh, we see that there are a few questions from the audience, you know, very good question. And uh, the first question, I will post it to uh, Eddie Sham. The question is this, would there be continued support from government on issuing more biogas quota? And how much biogas quota will be offered? Um, so Eddie Sham, what's your view on that? Yeah, thank you, Nick. I think this is it's a chipu a mass uh, question uh, because everybody <laughs> wants to know what is the what is the plan for the government and for the next uh, FIT quota. And uh, uh, as you know, when we start uh, bidding, uh, we want to maximize uh, uh, utilizing the Arifan to make sure all the biogas player can uh, can get support uh, in terms of the operating the the, the biogas plan. Uh. Since then, uh, we also. Uh, not only biogas, we also offering for the bio, uh, biomass and small hydro, just to make sure that we are uh, maximizing the the, the refund. Uh. Based on total record, what I mentioned before, we uh, when we release the biogas quota, it's always oversubscribed. This does mean we still have a certain uh, player that cannot uh, get the quota uh, throughout the year. And uh, from this situation, we try to get uh, approval from the from the our board from the militia just to because all the quota is based on the policy decision because i cannot mention right now but we try the best to make sure that uh, the biogas uh, project continue over the year yeah thank you Nick. thank you very much adisham okay so uh, we have second question and this one goes to soon um, the question is, how will the Domestic Emissions Trading Scheme, or DETS, announced by CASA, 
impact the overall biogas industry? Uh, soon, what's your point of view? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Yeah, so I, I think everyone is is focusing on this right now uh, due to the recent announcement uh, with the domestic air emission trading scheme coming up. So uh, unfortunately, the government hasn't released much detail <laughs> on uh, the rules and regulation of this domestic trading scheme. But I personally, I think it's very exciting moment because I've been um, working with carbon credits to instill the projects um, over the years. So I think I see a lot of opportunities, especially um, for some sectors such as Palmer Mills uh, uh, or Palmer sector, because Palmer sector has been, um, I could use the word discriminated around the world due to the deforestation issue and all that. So if you generate any common credits from Palmer or Power Gas, you will not be able to sell it uh, overseas. So I think if, if the government of Malaysia can set up something uh, to support the local industries, especially in the palm oil, or also the other sources, the livestock, uh, landfill, of course, has to be covered. Uh, that would be really good to to sort of um, tap the remaining biogas potential, I think. But I think for some sectors like bio, uh, palm oil, we, we may have some issues such as the uh, additionality issue in the carbon uh, context. What it means is because the government is making it mandatory for palm oil mills to be uh, equipped with biogas extraction, right? So then it's not additional, it's business as usual. So so on a carbon perspective, that will be an issue. Uh, so I think for the our Malaysia DETS, we, I don't know whether we'll have a chance to, to give comments to the government, but I, I think the government can look at different ways to incentivize projects. For example, uh, just now we mentioned how to incentivize bio CNG. Maybe those projects do additional things like upgrading the gas, uh, generating power. They should be eligible for the DETS, for example. So, so things like that could be could be discussed and formulated in the DETS. Thank you very much. Um, so, next question is um, uh, apologies. I think there is a bit of um, lag there. Uh, the question is: Has any other technologies been explored compared to what we have now for landfill biogas in terms of power generation? You know, for example, are there any technology from other parts of the world, such as in Germany and so on, specific on this? Uh, Chen, uh, do, do you have any insights about this question? Uh, basically, in our company, we are using. Uh, two brand of the engines, uh, namely MWM and MTU. Both are from Germany. Uh, they are, we have been using it for many years, I think 10 years already, the, the, the oldest engine. And uh, it's uh, quite reliable and quite stable and giving us the performance that we require. And most important, they have a local support team, which has, which they are able to support us uh, until now. Uh, but beside of the engine, uh, they are the P treatment as well that I heard, but we have not explored that to, to, the, to the extent. There is a one mechanical pretreatment system. I have not really remember the, the system as well. But then that one, maybe we can go further to explore because the gas from the landfill, we really need to treat it to remove the siloxane in order to, to give a good gas to the engine to perform. Thank you very much, Chan. Um, next question is, uh, this one is uh, to Datuk Khairuddin. Um, is bio CNG something worth considering from POM located far from the grid? Datuk, what's your view? Uh, yes, uh, like I mentioned before, um, for example, in Peninsula Malaysia, um, the infrastructure are very near to each other. The grid connectivity is near. So FIT is the most obvious um, I would say the most attractive uh, for a biogas developer to, to invest in. But in places such as, um, I would say more in Sabah, Sarawak, um, I would say uh, this um, bio CNG option is a good alternative uh, to FIT, whereby, um, for example, because, for example, I just give one example that uh, the project that we do in also in Kalimantan, in Kalimantan Timur for, for Indonesian listed company, whereby uh, uh, they just like in Sabah and Sarawak, they use a lot of diesel in their operation uh, at their palm oil mills, at their settlers, 
uh, at their plantation areas and at their using in their trucks. So what we have done, we have gone in to do a biogas plant there and we converted, we upgraded the gas and we converted uh, uh, their, their trucks, we converted uh, the, the gensets in the mills uh, to use gas, to use bio CNG. And what we realized after, after running for, uh, because we commissioned the plant about nearly two years ago, what the client realized after, after one year is that they can save, for example, up to two million liters of diesel. Uh, in their operation. So it's a lot of cost savings, few million ringgits of savings. So uh, what I suggest, for example, in areas whereby you cannot be connected to the grid, uh, bio CNG will be a good option. And also uh, during, uh, during this period, we also get a lot of inquiries from people doing data mining. Data mining whereby from biogas, either the excess power or you do a full biogas plant to supply uh, and to power up a data mining operation. And this is another maybe alternative that people can look out to. And also uh, maybe there are other, other options available whereby you can use biogas uh, to electricity to power up your own plantation and settling area. But like uh, soon said just now, usually for you to power up your own uh, plantation area, your mill, your settlers areas, you don't really use much uh, uh, kilowatt for that. So there will still be some excess power there. And maybe one more option, you from biogas, you can also do consider to do like co-gen, whereby you capture heat to, to get uh, more power. But at the end of the day, I would say that the most obvious um, uh, alternatives besides doing FIT will be the bio CNG. That is the most obvious that uh, the low hanging fruit that we are looking at as biogas developers in Malaysia. Thank you, Dato. Uh, Soon, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just want to add on to what Dato has said. Uh, another sort of innovation coming out towards our end would be the energy storage. Uh, I think this is a global trend, uh, the ESS, energy storage Sto solutions. This would be another way to distribute that energy uh, in rural areas, apart from bio CNG is another way. It depends on how you carry the energy, right? So uh, because ESS is still considered pretty expensive at the moment, but I foresee the price is going down just like the solar PV. So, so I think in no time, we'll be looking at charging these batteries and distributing it to the schools or whatever uh, in the rural areas. So that could be something to look forward to. No, that, that is very interesting, right? Because, um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation in terms of how the prices of these uh, batteries and technology will go cheaper with time. Um, so, so, so do you think that in the, in the future, there will be a possibility where, you know, these source of energy could be cheaper than fossil fuel? I mean, you know, I, I know that is uh, quite a difficult question to ponder, but, but what, what's your view? Does anyone have a point of view on that? Yeah, I could say something about that. Um, yeah. Well, if you look at what the large scale solar is doing now, it's already reaching the parity price. So um, I, I, I have no doubt that once government remove more subsidies on the fossil fuel, renewable energy will be the way to go. Yeah, I would say, like, I mean, there are countries that they have actually reached uh, parity or even lower than the cost of generation from fossil fuel. So, but of course, those sort of economies do not have any subsidies tied to the conventional fuel. But yeah. Right. Right. It's now, possible, that is something yeah. to ponder. Right. Yeah. I mean, which makes it very exciting for the for the biogas industry, isn't it? Um, okay. So the next question goes to Adisham. Um, with eventual phasing out of uh, feed-in tariff due to constraints on uh, re renewable energy fund, how can biogas projects be commercially viable? Quite an interesting question. Adishan, what's your view on that? Okay, thank you, Nick. Uh, in my previous slide, I've mentioned about the RE target by 2025 to 21%, uh, 20, uh, 40% at 2025. 2035 yeah so there is more and uh, we have a list of the initiative that to be uh, implemented uh, along the way to achieve the target and some proposed initiative uh, we we understand that the grid constraint uh, all over from the from the millers uh, because all the millers located at the remote area 
what we plan, uh, we will engaging in the clustering of, of all the palm mass oil for the biogas or biomass uh, uh, connection to just to make sure to get a cheaper grid connection. And uh, secondly, uh, we try to make it the uh, conduct ocean or net energy metering for uh, biogas and uh, biomass because what we see right now, NEM just focus for the solar PV, but I can see if uh, this is some potential because NEM itself, the spirit of the NEM is just uh, any generation from the from the uh, RE plant can use uh, by the own consumption and next uh, any remaining can uh, sell to the, to the grid. Yeah. Another thing, but uh, I very glad that uh, Dr. Karudin already start or the R&D about the bio CNG cogeneration, uh, but this is part of the uh, our initiative to to make sure that the uh, biogas industry is looking forward uh, uh, strategy. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much, Adisham. Uh, next question goes to Gladys. Um, how can the bank support or bridge the financing needs of biogas developers? Does Hong Leong Bank have the technical expertise to evaluate biogas projects? Uh, Gladys. Right. Thanks, Nick. Um, so, yes, definitely. It's a clear yes. So we can definitely support. I mean, um, Dr. Kairi did is a good example of uh, Concord, <laughs> the company that we have supported so far. So um, we do have uh, up to a certain extent, technical expertise. Um, I have with me as well another expert, renewable energy specialist, um, Cole Kangson. He also was actually from SEDA. So together, um, back in SEDA, we used to also, you know, be involved with the planning and the execution of technical requirements for bio I guess the training together with Eddie back in those days. Um, rest assured, you know, um, I know how a biogas plant smells. How so? You know, so you know, being there and experiencing and knowing what to look out for. I think, yeah, we are here to support and to understand customer needs because at the end of the day, right, when a bank supports um, an investment like this, we're actually in it together. It's not short term. It's it's long term. If your you know PPA is twenty one years, you know we're we're not going to be there for just five years. We're also going to make sure that we the success goes together with the bank because we're also putting in money um, in terms of the debt portion. So that's why you know we're in this together and we need to understand the subject. And if you need, you know, as a customer, you there are certain things that maybe you're unsure of, of you know, what kind of um, service, service level agreements that you need to actually look out for in terms of your engines, what kind of insurance coverage that you must have, you know, in order to protect your um, your development, this is where we also will come in to play a part and to advise you accordingly. So perhaps we'll have a conversation with uh, the person who asked this question. Feel right. free to drop me a line, yes. Excellent, yeah. Gladys. So so it sounds like, you know, your, your offering is not just about providing finance, financing, but also sharing insights and expertise as well. I, I think that's excellent. Okay, so next question goes to Chan. Um, how difficult or challenging is it to obtain approval from the local authorities for the construction of biogas from landfill project? Uh, look forward to hear what you say on this. Okay. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, it's not a big, it's not a challenge, but it's something that we need to face. I mean, not only in uh, our biogas, any development that you, we want to develop something or you want to build a house or factory, you still need to go through the local authorities. So the normal procedure we're going to apply on us. Uh, but as long as we can get a good consultants team that can engage the design, engage with the local authorities in various engineering department and also the planning departments, uh, we're still able to get through it. Yes. Yes, uh, I suppose that's logical. Uh, I think it goes back to, you know, the business case that you have, isn't it? OK, the next question is open to all. Um, so so feel free for any of you to volunteer to take this question. Will there be a corporate demand for biogas electricity? Should the TPA be enabled? Does anyone have a view? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, I think this is a very good question because the, the uh, Malaysia is driving towards this ESG agenda, Kusa Malaysia, Bengdangara. So I think all these corporate now are jumping into potentials on how to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, 
renewable energy certificate has been um, pushed by SEDA earlier. I think it's another area of potential where biogas project can be one of the sources you know, to generate this uh, renewable energy certificate where corporate then can come in and use it to offset their emissions, for example. So uh, definitely this is going to be coming. Even the banks like Hong Leong, I'm pretty sure you seeing how to synergize your green investment as part of your portfolio uh, assessment. So I think it is coming very, very big uh, in the corporate world. Okay. Um, does anyone else have uh, anything to add before we uh, wrap up? Yeah, okay. Right, so uh, for the next one, I mean, we've been having, uh, you know, close to 90 minutes of really, really good discussion. Thank you very much for your point of view. Uh, I'm sure the audience, um, you know, uh, enjoyed uh, listening to your point of view. I definitely did. I also learned a lot. Um, so, so for the next one, can I ask each of you to provide, um, you know, a two minute summary to encapsulate your your, your point of view? Um, you know, uh, what is what is it, the key message you want people to remember? What is the way forward and so on? Uh, maybe we start with you, Dato Within. Yeah, uh, thank you, Nick. Um, in summary, um, like I mentioned just now, uh, in Malaysia, we still have the be best framework and policy and incentives across the region. But moving forward, uh, I really wish and hope that the government shall continue with the current frameworks and incentives. Because as we know, uh, the biogas industry, the RE industry in Malaysia is mainly government driven as of now and for the government to continue with their FIT uh, mechanism in the near future until a stage whereby the biogas players, biogas de developers becoming more creative and they get uh, more stable off takers. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, the biogas players, my wish is for all of us to be more um, to, to consider more alternative and viable uh, al um, um, output for biogas. For example, like we mentioned just now, to do maybe bio CNG, to power up data mining, uh, like um, Sun mentioned just now, to, to energy storage is a good option also. And then maybe in terms of the excess power to do, um, to, to, to power up own plantation, uh, to um, to use uh, internally for the boilers. So those are the users. But in the meantime, uh, we still need the government to support. And uh, hopefully with uh, the help and creativity of the industry and the research and development that is being done uh, within the biogas industry, we can find alternative users uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dato. Uh, Chan, uh, your point of view, please, your summary. I think I share the same view uh, with Tato, uh, Tato Karudin. But uh, to add on it, uh, I also hope that uh, from the government, I mean, not aside from the uh, SEDA, KPKT that side, uh, if they can have uh, more, uh, can, can expedite on the construction of the regional landfills. So this would help us to, uh, I mean, all the player to can go into it and, and can get more uh, landfill biogas project. And as a company, we ourselves, we would going to move forward by uh, try to researching, experimenting, and change our design in order to harvest the more have efficiently on our landfill gas. Yeah. Thank this you very much. On. Thank you. Uh, soon, uh, what's your view? Yeah, I think just to recap back, basically, I think there are still a lot of untapped potential in biogas sector in Malaysia. And uh, I think government is very well aware of the bottleneck or the barriers. And uh, I'm glad to hear they are working towards it. So I hope the government, together with the industry players, um, Eddie must <laughs> remember that, uh, should work towards a common solution to realize all this untapped uh, pollution. Uh, potential. I also look forward uh, to new mechanisms such as the DETS or any other instruments because sad to say Malaysian businessman likes to be incentivized. And that's a fact. Yeah, we are, we are a group of people who likes to be given uh, some sweet to, to do something. So so I think that's, that's how it is and uh, I, I think it will work if the right mechanism is put in place. 
Excellent. Uh, Adisham, your summary, please. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Okay, in point, uh, in uh, point of uh, my point is um, when uh, as a person involved uh, 20 years uh, by guys uh, arena, 10 years uh, design or operate the biogas plant, and another 10 years uh, as a greater in a SEDA, I see biogas industry is a is a new chapter right now. Yeah. Uh, uh, for example, Dato uh, Dato Karudin in the Concord Group uh, from zero to hero right now, recognizing locally and internationally. And uh, Chan, you have 10 megawatt <laughs> biogas plant at one side. Uh. You should get uh, involved, uh, recognized by the Malaysian Book of Record. I oh. personally have a, a, <laughs> looking a for it. <laughs> feeling when, when my, uh, yeah, yeah, my, my project at the, per, the first biogas project in Malaysia in 2022. Yeah, 20, 2022, yeah, 22. Now this is your time to bring bright all the biogas project, 10 megawatt and next year 12 megawatt, right? 12 megawatt at one, uh. one site. I want to give message from these two to to scenario uh, that make comfortable to bankers to finance more project in the biogas. <laughs> yeah, especially only on lah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Nick. Thank, thank you, you Adisham. Sounds very exciting indeed. Uh, Gladys, your summary, please. All right, thank you. Um, I I hear uh, Eddie's message, and I think that from the bank's perspective. Perspective. The biogas sector is definitely one that can help the nation transition its energy mix to a lower carbon economy. And as much as possible, we should also try to optimize and harness this potential. And also via you know, supporting financing these projects at HLB, we are committed to supporting um, the government's target as well of reducing GHG emission intensity to GDP. I think everybody knows COP26 will be starting by the end of the month. And our country has actually pledged a 45% reduction in GDP, uh, GHG emission intensity against GDP. So, you know, biogas would be that sector. But also, Eddie, can I remind you that um, these incentives, you know, we're on a very good trajectory. You know, you see all this building up. We have uh, zero to hero success stories, um, Concord, and also the landfill gas as big as that. Um, I hope that it'll continue because I see that in the foresee foreseeable future, government will still play a very key role in providing direct incentives, such as a, like a fit in tariff. And if not, we really need a lot of innovation. And I think key stakeholders need to come in to say, um, to put into perspective and the framework that will make things uh, happen. For example, like if bio CNG or third party access for gas would, would actually come into place, then there must be a very clear framework of how that can be um, executed so that from the bank's perspective, it's also clear on what are the mandates, who are the parties involved, who are the regulators, and, and it's very easy then for us to come in and finance a project. So I think that's my key summary for today. Thank Excellent, Gladys. That was a fantastic summary. Okay, so uh, we now uh, reach to the end of our session. Um, so I would like to say how enjoyable this conversation has been. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed talking to each of you. Therefore, I would like to thank each of you, Datuk Khairuddin, uh, Chan, Soon, uh, Eddie Sham, and also Gladys. Thank you very much for sharing your point of view with me and also with all of us. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, Hong Leong Bank uh, for inviting uh, all of us to this session today. I think it's very well organized. And number three, thank you to, to all of you who are watching this, who are listening to this. Um, you know, um, I, I think, um, you know, it's been, um, you know, I, I hope that we can do this again, you know, because uh, this is a very exciting topic. You know, we can drill down more into other issues and so on. So, so with that, um, I, I close the session and uh, I wish all of you a great day ahead. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Well done. Bye. 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 Bye.